Hello, thank you for joining us. Welcome from me, Michael Scott, usually in Oxford, but today in France, and from my joint convener, Sanford J. Ungar in Washington, DC, to the 47th jointly promoted event between the Future of the Humanities Project and the Free Speech Project. The latter is sponsored by Georgetown University and the former by Georgetown's Humanities Initiative in association with Campion Hall, Oxford, and the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions, and freedoms in a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression, and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who is director of the Free Speech Project. He will introduce today's distinguished guests and moderate the ensuing discussion before I return to chair the question and answer session. From the start, you can type in questions to the panel by using the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the chat button, but just the Q and A button. These questions will come to me during the session and I will try and put them to the panel to consider in the second part. We urge you to ask your questions as and when they occur to you so that we don't get a bottleneck at the end. So I'm looking forward greatly again to this, uh, to this very important discussion today. Over to you, Sandy. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, distinguished indeed, our panel today, Baroness Shami Chakrabarti, who is a labor peer in the House of Lords and a tireless campaigner for human rights around the world. Uh, she is the author of On Liberty, I suppose, with apologies to John Stuart Mill, and uh, a number of other works talking about the importance of human rights and human affairs. Uh, Ronald Krodoshinsky directs the program in Constitutional Studies and the Initiative for Civic Engagement at the Law School of the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, I believe, in uh, the southern part of the state, one of the people who upholds the banner of free speech and free expression in the southern part of the United States. Um, Adrian Shabazz is from Freedom House, a private nonprofit organization that uh, looks over uh, freedom in the world, publishes a volume every year telling us how the various countries in the world are doing in respecting individual and, and group freedoms. And he is in charge of reports like the annual on Freedom on the Internet, Nations in Transition, and other new work on transnational repression. Lord William Wallace is the Liberal Democratic spokesman for the Cabinet Office and Constitutional Issues, also in the House of Lords. He joined the Liberal Party as a student a few years ago, fought five parliamentary elections, and led the party's manifesto in the 1979 and 97 elections. So he's got a lot of history on this subject. In 1996, he was appointed to the House of Lords as a Liberal Democratic spokesman on foreign affairs and defense. Uh, we have a, a somewhat ironic title today, is, is Democracy a Democratic Form of Government, which is really intended to ask the question, has democracy just become a sort of symbolic word that we all like to describe our systems of government, or do we really do the... Uh, various places that call themselves democracy actually follow democratic practices. I'm going to turn first to Adrian Shabazz from Freedom House because he has a sort of catalog and can tell us uh, what the trends are and and uh, where things seem to be happening in this in this domain right now. Adrian? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here um, with all of you. So Freedom House, we are a, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. And, and one of the things that we are most known for, um, as mentioned, is producing freedom in the world. We've been producing this analysis for over 50 years. Um, and what we've generally seen is that over this 50 year period, there was a, a period of the, what some have called the third wave of democratization. 
um, where you had many authoritarian regimes, many military dictatorships that people believed would never fall. Um, but over in the 70s and particularly in the 80s in places like South America and in Europe um, and in East Asia, uh, democratized. And um, in contrast to that and in contrast to some of the enthusiasm around uh, democratization around the world, for the past 18 years, we've actually seen a reversal of that trend. So um, specifically what we have seen is that those countries that are um, more in the not free category of, of the countries that we rank are becoming less and less free. So countries like Russia, countries like China, um, Iran and others are essentially cracking down uh, even more on the limited level of freedom that we've seen. That's been the major trend when we've done our data analysis for the past 18 years. Um, and it's been interesting to see where exactly that crackdown has come. When we looked at the 18-year the decline, there was one indicator that stood out. We have 21 indicator or uh, 25 indicators that we look at. And the one indicator that has driven the decline in global freedom is a decline in freedom of expression um, and media freedom, which I think is very appropriate um, for this convening. So it's it's been a certainly a gloomy trend. You know, there's certainly some some pushback. There have been some gains, countries that have risen from not free to partly free and partly free to free. There's also been some um, backsliding within democracies, as, as uh, we'll go through, I'm sure. Um, I would say that over the 50 year period, the general trend, which is a, a positive one, is that once countries receive that status as a free country under our ratings, they tend to stay free. So, uh, you know, despite the level of backsliding that we are seeing in many democracies, it's still rather rare for a, uh, let's say, a consolidated liberal democracy to slide all the way down into autocracy, um, particularly those countries that have had a free status for a long time. Um, but that said, you know, we certainly never know. And there are important reasons why um, we are genuinely seeing democratic backsliding in places like the United States and in Europe and Brazil, other democracies. So um, that's sort of a, a global sense of, of where we are. Can you cite a, a couple other examples for us of the backsliding and what you what you characterize as backsliding? What some of the examples are of the practices uh, turning around? Of the reversing of the backsliding? Well, or actually, the, of the backsliding itself. Of the backsliding itself, I'm sorry. Sure thing. Sure thing. So um, we generally see it starting within uh, restrictions on civil liberties. So, um, you know, we generally start to see the passage of laws that um, restrict what journalists are doing, um, increased obligations on academics, um, on the private sector as well. Um, so there's there's a legal component of this where it's almost a, a gradual heightening of laws and regulations to um, and essentially to restrict or even criminalize certain parts of civil society. Um, we see that I think India is a, a really mm -hmm. important example of this where um, you have all sorts of laws, laws on um, foreign contributions, laws on tax, um, laws on um on elections where uh, are on the spreading of so-called false news that are then weaponized against government opponents. So it's essentially using the rule of law to crack down on true democracy, on, on one's political opponents. Um, and I would say that generally, you know, those crackdowns with some exceptions, they tend to be through this legal nature where it's more gradual and where it can be harder to spot until it's too late. Um, you know, it's really seldom that we see a wave of arrest. There are certainly countries that are more on the partly free spectrum, um, where you, I'm thinking of a Nicaragua or um, or even places like, um, well, some of the more less free countries as well within um, South America, where you start to see a, a, a large crackdown on civil society. You see political prisoners being um, imprisoned, places like Tunisia in Venezuela. Um, in Thailand as well, where we're starting to see more and more imprisonments of the political opposition. 
So there is this legal nature to it. And I think this gets back to the to the the, the title of uh, of today's discussion, which is that it's it's no longer the time where there's this in some ways where there's a clear distinction between you know half of the world is is a dictate is dictatorships and others are democracies you have nearly every country around the world that claims to be a democracy um the russia china claim to be democracies you have the democratic people's republic of korea or north korea so from an from an international norms perspective um many authoritarian leaders have become quite savvy of using the language of democracy, using the language of human rights to legitimize themselves both internationally and, and within their own people, and then using the instruments of uh, of democracy, like a, a court or the passage of laws, um, in a way that is totally against the principles of democracy, right? So they're going against their own opposition, those particular ethnic and religious um, uh, groups, um, who they sell as enemies of the people in order to to justify their own power. Um, so it's it's generally, you know, I would just say that it, it tends to be this gradual process. Gradual is not to say that it doesn't have an impact on people. It actually has a, a devastating impact on people's freedom. Um, and it tends to be where once we see that crackdown on civil liberties, then there is this crack, then we see the declines in political rights. So it's once the government, the elected government, who may have even been freely elected, they essentially use all of their power to then pull up the rope so that nobody can contest them in power. Thank you uh, very much, Andrew. Uh, Shami, from your perch in the House of Lords and your long experience with these matters, what do you, how would you characterize what's been happening? Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you. Sandy, and once more, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be here um, with such interesting and interested people. Um, the, I, I um, recognise so much in what I heard from Adrian's um, worldview. Um, I, a few months ago, read Al Pashar's work on India. You know, Al Pashar, the, um, uh, I think she's been a professor at the LSE for some time. She's, uh, I think, about to move to Oxford. She wrote a book about India called The Incarcerations, um, about, you know, anybody who annoyed Mr. Modi, whether a lawyer or a trade unionist or journalist, you know, finding themselves literally locked up in some cases indefinitely. And that's in India that, um, you know, the parents that my parents came from that, that, that considers itself, you know, this wonderful populous uh, democracy. Um, and, and we see similar trends all over the place. And frankly, there's been backsliding in the UK. Um, and um, I, I can say this and you can't, um, there was some some backsliding uh, under Mr. Trump's presidency, including things like not recognising results of free elections and um, urging your, you know, urging your people to, um, to, to mount insurrection in the face of election results. This is not the sort of thing that I ever thought I would see in these great democracies. And the United States is a great democracy that is looked to all over the world, no question. So we all watch with bated breath what uh, what happens there. The one issue I would take with Adrian is when he talked about, he, I think he used the phrase, using the rule of law to crack down on liberties. And I don't think it's the rule of law that is being used. It might be the law that's being used, but that's not the rule of law as, as we see it. So I'm very much, um, people have many debates about the rule of law. Let's just say we can't have democracy without first having the rule of law. You can't I, have I, I, really civilization without, without the rule of law, let alone democracy. The rule of law does require a respect for institutions. The rule of law does require equal treatment for everybody under the law, including the president, the prime minister, wealthy people, and so on. So I think what we've seen is not the rule of law. We've seen the rule of law disrespected and legislation sometimes enacted for the purposes of cracking down on fundamental rights and freedoms. I, cer I certainly agree with that. The one thing I would add to the mix and to Adrian's um, excellent analysis, is that I don't think it's a coincidence that this current phase of backsliding coincides with some uh, of the most incredible um, inequality 
and uh, and wealth that we have ever seen in human in human history. And I think the new imperium is not the British Empire or the American Empire or even the China. The new imperium is an imperium of billionaires who are so wealthy that they are wealthier than countries, they can buy and sell politicians, they can influence elections, they can incite riots, in, they can sit in California, as we saw this summer, and, and um, incite riots in the north of England and in Northern Ireland. And one of the one of the problems that we have a quarter of the way into the 21st century is that, you know, we thought we had universal suffrage. We thought we had the rule of law. We thought we had democracy. But but are we equipped for this new challenge of massive corporations, incredibly wealthy individuals? You could argue that, you know, their share, their shareholders have suffrage. But do the people working in an Amazon warehouse or um, receiving orders and directions and threats from Elon Musk. You know, where is the democracy in that? And are we capable of protecting any semblance of democracy if we can't, as an international community, start uh, holding these these massive corporations and the and the billionaire bros who own them holding those corporations to account? Thank you, thank you, Shami. Uh, William Wallace, are are you surprised by these developments after your long career, after your uh, work on the metaphorical, if not physical, barricades of democracy? I'm no, I'm not at all surprised. Uh, I thought the euphoria when the Soviet Union collapsed uh, was overdone, particularly in the United States, and I spent some time trying to help some of these former socialist countries uh, develop democratic institutions. And as they discovered how difficult it was, you have to have a decentralized market economy and you have to have the rule of law, which takes some time to establish because it's a matter of culture as much as anything else. And uh, the problems of how to establish a well-regulated market economy, uh, which is what a democracy needs, come up against uh, capitalists uh, and financiers who want to make sure that they get the money. So I agree strongly with uh, Shami that the economic dimension of democracy is a very important one. Um, I remember well Danny Roderick, Turkish economist now at Harvard, saying that uh, you can have two of three fundamental things, democracy, national sovereignty, and global economic integration. And global economic integration, which concentrates wealth in uh, a number of, of limited hands, is a real problem for democracy, which has to be nationally based. And when you see governments beginning to bend regulation to favour people they want to give contracts to, as we've seen in my country in, in, in Britain during the COVID pandemic, you are beginning to weaken democracy. That's a huge problem when the rapid spread of technology, for example, does concentrate power in a small number of mainly US-based corporations. Uh, and these have adverse effects in countries all over the rest of the world, and people feel disempowered. Ron Kurdyshinsky, uh, you uh, are in Alabama, and it's a stronghold of former President Trump and uh, the new new image of the Republican Party. And and I just wonder what you can say about your your neighbors there. About do they feel that they are strengthening democracy. Do they uh, do they see themselves as fighters for democracy? Well, I, I think many uh, devotees of uh, MAGA view themselves as supremely committed to democracy and democratic self-government. And uh, the Republican Party in Alabama, which is MAGA-dominated, uh, achieves 60-70% results. I think this goes to a bigger question that we haven't really addressed as to whether democracy itself 
is a desirable, uh, at least unfiltered, uncut democracy is a desirable form of government. And I'll lean in on a fairly famous Brit who's no longer with us, a couple actually, uh, Ronald Dworkin, uh, mm -hmm. who wrote lucidly and repeatedly about the idea mm -hmm. that democracy without any guardrails is not a particularly attractive form of government. Certain decisions like whether you worship, who you worship, what you worship, mm -hmm. what you do in private, uh, what you read, what you don't read, all of these sort of fundamental decisions that are constitutive of human identity uh, have to be made freely by the individual and without the coercive power of the government. The fact that a majority of people believe that everyone should be Southern Baptist or no one should be gay uh, is entirely beside the point in, in terms of creating a fundamentally justly ordered society. So there's that. Uh, and I want to go uh, also to something that uh, uh, Baroness Chakrabarty said about rule of law. Uh, I've recently published a book with Oxford, Mandatory Plug, uh, Free Speech is Civic Structure. And what I found across democratic self-government is that as between a text, uh, a parchment tiger, uh, to use Madison's turn of phrase, and independent courts, ideally vested with the power of judicial review, if you want democracy and free speech, and free speech is integral to democracy, you need independent courts, ideally vested with the power of judicial review. Uh, and in fact, in the UK, Anthony Lester made, along with Ronald Dworkin, made this argument over and over. And these incremental reforms like the Human Rights Act 98 got adopted, but the judges still don't have a full power of judicial review. That said, British courts are excellent. They're staffed with very thoughtful, careful, and independent jurists. And we can see why the courts are so essential, right? Politicians, as two of our panelists have noted, are self-interested. When they regulate elections and electoral speech, they're going to do so to make their re-election easier, not harder. So, for example, malapportionment. Uh, if you wait for a malapportioned legislator to reapportion itself, it's going to be like waiting for Godot. In fact, the Supreme Court of Japan, which has uh, invalidated legislation fewer than 10 times since 1947 and democratic government in Japan, uh, has done so to get rid of malapportionment. Why? Because if you don't get rid of malapportionment, uh, it's never going to be fixed. And it's fundamentally unjust for one voter to have 10 or 20 or a thousand times the voting strength of another voter. Uh, and you look at places like Russia, which had an independent court, which Putin systematically destroyed, and places like Hungary and Poland. I mean, Donald Tusk now is trying to figure out how to fix the Polish courts after law and justice has systematically tried to politicize them. But if you want free speech, if you want democracy, you have to have an umpire that checks the worst impulses of the incumbent legislators. And the UK has that. I don't. When I fly to London, I don't worry about being thrown in a gulag. Uh, the judges are there. And even before the Human Rights Act, they were protecting speech, both the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords and the Court of Appeal. I do think judicial review would be a nice, formal judicial review, a nice add-on. But a lot of these countries, the first thing the, the uh, would-be authoritarian does is destroys the independence of the courts. And if you want to figure out whether the free speech is protected, you're far more likely to find it in a country that has independent courts mm -hmm. than in one that has a free speech guarantee and a written constitution. It, when, when Adrian was going over the, his sort of list before, he mentioned Nicaragua, which strikes me, I'm old enough to remember in the 70s, the fight, the struggle for freedom in Nicaragua, the dictators of decades and decades were being overthrown by the so-called Sandinistas, named for the uh, Sandino, the great uh, uh, rebel of Nicaraguan history. And the the people who came to power, it was a great, it was quite a lot of controversy over this in the United States. People took sides, the Reagan administration, tried to shore up the so-called Contras who were opposing the revolution there. Well, the revolution in Nicaragua turned out to be a revolution right back to the times of Somoza. After all was said and done, the repression in Nicaragua today is probably as severe as it has ever been. And there's one man, Daniel Ortega, who, uh, who calls all the shots. And and so um, I think for at least people of my generation, this must be particularly uh, demoralizing, uh, having stood up, having having declared oneself in various places to be on the side of the people, on the side of, of popular democracy, only to have the popular Democrats turn into autocrats 
who are who seem more efficient at it than anyone than anyone before. So so why should people not be discouraged? Uh, Shami, we might come back to you on this. Why is it not discouraging to see something like that happen in a row? It's incredibly discouraging. Time? Look, I miss, I, I'm occasionally discouraged myself. Um, a, a shameless plug for my own book, um, which is recently out called Human Rights, The Case for the Defence. What a thing to have to write in the UK. What a book to have to, you know, why did Penguin commission me to write a book called Human Rights, The Case for the Defence? a quarter of the way into the 21st century in our so-called mature democracy because rights, freedoms, even our courts have been trashed in popular media and political discourse in the United Kingdom in recent years. You know, I am nostalgic for Reagan and Thatcher. I'm a woman of the democratic left. I am nostalgic for Reagan and for Thatcher compared with what we've seen um, in the in the Conservative Party, the Republican Party in the US and the British Conservative Party in recent years. Why? Because there was some respect for the rule of law as the rules of the game of democracy, the guardrails, as Ronald um, as Ronald called them. The one issue I would take with Ronald, by the way, is when he said we don't have judicial review in the UK. We have a very developed system of judicial review. We just don't have strike down powers for for primary legislation we don't have that nuclear weapon for the for our supreme court and you know the argument was always made if you give the supreme court strike down powers as in the united states you politicize you politicize that court you know that was the that was the kind of argument and you know we don't have a written constitution here we don't have an entrenched bill of rights we took the you know many of us took the view for years that that was okay we had a nice evolved gentleman's agreement of a of a constitution i used to take that view i'm not sure i take it anymore because i think the problem with a gentleman's agreement is what is the agreement when the gentlemen have all left the room and the sort of the sort of assault on rights and freedoms and even the judiciary and lawyers that i've seen in recent years in the uk forget other scary places has been really has been really quite something so you're right the threats to um the threat Threats to what I think of as democracy, which has the rule of law and fundamental rights and freedoms at its heart. The threats can come from left and right. We use this word populism a lot. We throw it around. We call people hard left and far right. What do we mean by that? For me, the definition of somebody who is is a threat to democ is a populist threat to democracy is someone who does not believe in those institutions, does not believe in the rules of the game, does not, you know, um, does not take that bipartisan approach that the great Ronald Walkin, I think of him as an American, by the way, but the, the great Ronald Walkin wrote about in all his work. But that lovely 2008 uh, book, Is Democracy Possible Here, that he wrote for a political lay audience, suggesting that Republicans and Democrats could have could agree around certain fundamental values. That 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 settlement seems to be seems to be under threat from left and right at different times um, all over the world. But there are still some of us flying the flag and still trying to, you know, still trying to to believe and advocate for those values even today. William. Let, let's ask you to take up uh, Dworkin's question. Is is true democracy possible in this world we're living in right now? Well, you know, we can all argue about what true democracy is. Uh, there's a clear distinction between liberal democracy and popular democracy. Um, if you take the Federalist Papers, which were written to justify the US Constitution as an example. They talk about democracy as a process and as one in which you need to go through various hoops before decisions are imposed because uh, allowing popular enthusiasm or popular emotion to sweep away uh, reasoned discussion of what the consequences of taking a major decision will be can be a huge mistake as the United Kingdom made over leaving the European Union, for example. Uh, a perfect example of uh, a wonderful populist argument sweeping aside all of the evidence about what it might mean for the economy 
and for future freedom of movement and everything else. So uh, democracy is a very difficult thing to establish and maintain. You need to have the rule of laws, we've all said. You need to have a pretty good distribution of wealth and of taxation. And the idea that each citizen is equal in a democracy has also to be sustained by making sure that they are not too unequal economically and socially. And there are plenty of people in any country whose interests are in gaining undue concentrations of power, social prestige and wealth. So working to hold up to democratic standards and democratic culture is a constant thing we have to work on, otherwise it slips away. Ron, are you optimistic? Oh, God, no. And in fact, one other condition I would add for a functioning democracy where voters use the electoral process in a meaningful way to hold government accountable and implement uh, policy preferences is education, right? And we're talking really about, I think, two separate things. Uh, and I can't speak to the UK, but here in the US, uh, constitutional literacy is abysmal. People don't know what the Senate is, what the Supreme Court does. Uh, they, when Donald Trump says, if I, if the president does it, it's legal. They don't have the ability to, to assess the validity of that claim under the terms of the constitution. So when you have voters who don't understand the institutions of government or the doctrines they animate it, like federalism and separation of powers, it's hard to see how they're going to make prudent choices. Uh, and we also don't have media literacy. So uh, J.D. Vance and Donald Trump have been saying that uh, Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio, mm. have been stealing and using as food uh, local pets, cats and dogs, geese and ducks in the local parks. Blatant lie. Everyone in Springfield, Illinois, said it's false. J.D. Vance continues to, to perpetrate this lie, this libel on this community. And yet, and yet, and yet, polling data from reputable companies shows that 52% of Republican voters in the United States believe these immigrants are stealing Fluffy the cat and Spot the dog and making them into barbecue. Uh, we had ping, Comet Ping Pong uh, in 2016 with Hillary Clinton being accused of running children in a uh, trafficked way in a brothel in the basement of this pizza. A guy from North Carolina went to liberate the kids and shot the place up. Uh, so we have just uh, an ocean of disinformation and misinformation we have Elon Musk perpetrating it with uh, deep fakes of Kamala Harris in a Communist Party outfit. And uh, so we have these media moguls in the U.S. who under the First Amendment appear to be able to permit or censor whatever they wish. I don't know why Elon Musk or, or Mark Zuckerberg is to be preferred to Joe Biden or Merrick Garland. Censorship mm -hmm. is censorship. And we need to think more carefully about the processes of democracy and the yes. marketplace of political ideas. But we, we have so many problems with both the ability of people to receive and assess the validity of information and therefore the ability to cast well-informed rational votes. And I would point to Finland as a country that's actually done a really good job with at least media literacy, which they put great emphasis on, but to go to the points made uh, by uh, Lord Wallace and uh, Baroness Chakrabarty, Finland has very little wealth inequality. It's a very wealthy mm -hmm. place. They have high levels of education. And so they, have the social conditions necessary to create citizens who are capable of self-government. Jefferson said, if you expected people to be successfully self-governing in a state of ignorance, you want something that has never been and will never be across the entire history of humanity. Ditto Dewey, uh, Dewey ditto uh, 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 Alexander Micklejohn. So I don't know what the other panelists think about how to fix the process of democratic deliberation, but here in the United States, the word that comes to mind is, a, is an R word beginning with F. Uh, and uh, I, I'm deeply pessimistic about our election. Uh, we have voters in a state of ignorance, complete ignorance. You're breaking my heart, Professor. You are breaking my heart. Because when, from this side of the pond, you know, we watch American movies, everyone's taking the fifth. And, you know, one has this sense that, <laughs> that surely kids growing up in American schools will at least can recite their, their Bill of Rights. But you're painting a, a, um, a much more, a much more de depressing picture. But of course, um, I mean, I think some, I think it was William who said earlier that um, 
we have the tension between you know globalization of the economy and democracy which must be national well guess it yes of course as national democracies are very important as a unit of of, of, of self-determination and self-governance but international treaties and international human rights conventions in particular are supposed to help um help um create a rule of law for the world for you know for, for the world and um and and help us prevent wars and and all the rest of it i do think that we need some tre new treaties in addition to our post war settlement governing things like the internet um i i i don't think we are i don't think we're as developed as we need to be in relation to holding these tech these tech emperors to to account and, and then we're squabbling over taking back control and brexit and this that and the other and even squabbling about elections when actually people are governed by whoever they're governed by apple google um you know the social media platform formerly known as twitter people are living in this new continent i think of the internet as a new continent but it is largely ungoverned there are no sheriffs on that new continent, let alone right. formally developed democratic and, and legal systems. Adrian, I, uh, one, of, one of the Henry, aspects of democracy, if I may just add, one of the things which commends democracy at the minimum is that it has term limits. Elections come and you can throw the rascals out and have someone else in. And what we've seen in the last two election cycles in the United States is that that's been challenged first by the uh, January the 6th riot in Washington and Trump's refusal to recognize the election result. And this time, as it seemed to start with, that we had uh, two men roughly my age, and I'm very glad I'm not going to be standing in office in the near future, um, who were refusing to step down uh, and not offering a really wide choice. Thank goodness that's changed a little. But democracy does also require that those in power recognize when the time comes, they should step out of power. Adrian, you sent out a dog's breakfast for us earlier that's been picked over now. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, first of all, what some of your reactions are to what you've heard, but also, are there some places that make you optimistic? Uh, Ron mentioned Finland. Uh, are there some other places that give you hope? Yes, thank you. Well, I would say, let me start by saying I, I align myself with with much of what um, what the fellow panelists have said. I think they've they've all made some really great points here. On um, I wanted to touch on on the broader link between globalization and the backlash against globalization and where we are now and and bringing it back to democracy. So. Um, the Baroness was right to point out that, um, you know, the 18 years of decline coincides with the sort of apex of economic globalization. It also coincides with the entry of uh, China into the World Trade Organization, um, as well as the rise of the Internet. And I do think that these trends are somehow linked. Um, and what I would say is that right now, it's a very interesting time to be talking about global democracy, um, whether that's about the state of democracy within countries or at the international level um, through human rights treaties and the work of the UN, because we're going in a totally different direction. And I think what's interesting, if I might just outline what I think that that direction is, I don't think we have to go that way, but it's it's what is the the resurgent theme in a lot of countries right now is the backlash against globalization. And there are good things that come with it and there are bad things that come with it. Um, I myself am a child of globalization. I mean, my parents are from very different backgrounds, uh, Afghan and Italian. Um, they met in France. I was born in the United States. I've been able to you know, live in many different countries and work at, at in many different places. So I'm you know, in some ways, I've I'm benefited tremendously from the the opening of the world, right? And the opportunities that that has provided from people, including people from um, lower economic backgrounds or from countries that are um, outside of the sort of core. What's interesting to see is that there is this backlash against the economic aspects of globalization, um, and I firmly believe that we do have to 
be holding power to account. You know, that is a fundamental part of uh, how we ensure self-governance is to make sure that there is no such big centralization of power. That's also the idea behind the separation of power within government. Um, and I think it's time that we extend that also to the private sector. And that's where the work of anti-monopoly practices and competition policy is particularly important. Uh, I think it's driven by that same idea, that same value. But what we are seeing is this backlash against the other. You know, It's essentially right. a backlash against pluralism. And I think that is particularly dangerous. You see this in the United States. You see it in places like India, um, throughout Europe with the rise of the far right. Um, there is a sort of ethnic nationalism that is coming about and the supremacy of, of one people over another. And these anti-globalization um, ideas are channeled into that to say that we are, we as a people need to take back power. And it's either taking back power from billionaires or it's taking back power from these international bodies, whether that's Brussels or the United Nations or the WTO, or it's taking back power from immigrants, essentially, or the, these others within the LGBTQ community. You know, there are all of these conspiracies about all of these actors working in unison to with one another somehow to uh, to reject the power of the majority. And I think and it's really interesting to see, starting with somebody like Viktor Orban in Hungary, but also uh, Modi in, in India, Donald Trump in the United States, is they're using this similar narrative. And it's something that is picked up by Vladimir Putin in Russia and used to connect with right wing audiences around the world is this um, backlash against against these all of these different people, as well as the the economic policies that have come about that. And that's where there is a they're trying to shift the idea of democracy away from liberal democracy, the idea of balancing majoritarian rights with a with minority rights. And instead, it's full on majoritarianism, right? It's the people need to regain power and sovereignty. And um, I find that ideology quite dangerous because it, it it assumes a level of violence against the other. It assumes um, a level of violence against institutions, right? And we saw that with January 6th and with election denialism, where the populism comes from almost this, this myth that this national leader reflects the will of the people. And if exactly. you question that, um, you are against the will of the people. You are against even oh. democracy, some would say, right? I think you're and so think... right, Adrian. You're so right. We had this with Boris Johnson shutting down Parliament. He shut down Parliament in 2019 because it was annoying him, because it was frustrating his Brexit arrangements. And he shut them. And the, 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 arts, the, the justification he gave was the one you just cited, the will of the people. So you have this charismatic, hard man leader, whoever it is, and they've got a direct line to the will of the people. The irony is, of course, they're usually quite wealthy. They're supposedly ethnic nationalists, but they're all in cahoots with each other. They're all literally talking to each other. They're very international in the way that they work, actually. Right. And they're selling this bill of goods to the people. And saying I've got the will, I've I've got the will of the people. It is, um, you know, it's it's not new. I mean, there are similarities with the 1930s. It has to be, it has to be said. Except, you know, we've got even greater challenges with the technology and so on, as you described. But I think we just have to, you know, the lib the liberals, if you like, the constitutionalists, the rights people, have to have to find ways to cooperate, and to and to respond. But, but if I add just one, uh, uh, democracy is this. broken. People, voters in the U.S. are in echo chambers. They're on social media in groups that sort by ideology. So if you're in MAGA, you're not listening to Hillary Clinton or Tim Walls or Kamala Harris. You're listening to Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity. So mm -hmm. and social media makes money. We know this from the Facebook whistleblower by keeping people angry and riled. Mm -hmm. So uh, people exist in echo chambers where everyone is saying the same thing and they're siloed so that the kind of deliberation and engagement, which is really critical, Alexander Mickeljohn makes this point very clearly, uh, that is essential to a functioning uh, democracy that produces decent government, 
simply can't exist. And, and the profit motive of these corporations, Facebook, X, uh, yeah. YouTube, uh, 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 TikTok, uh, is to encourage anger and balkanization not dialogue and engagement. So if all of us were talking about how to make the government better, I think we could probably work it out. We might have some differences, but we would talk to each other. Uh, people in the US don't engage, they're in tribes and the degree of polarization is off the charts. And so, and also this polarization benefits Donald Trump as does ignorance. Uh, so that if you have a political party that gains electoral advantage, through balkanization, polarization, ignorance, they have no incentive, right, to make voters more capable of uh, finer and more factually accurate uh, judgments about the way the world is. Trump has been saying, for example, that foreign countries pay tariffs. Most Republicans believe this. They don't accept that the tariff is passed on by the seller of the good or service to the consumer. So how do you, you know, he says China is going to pay the tariffs. And most Republican voters uh, believe this. How do we operate democracy in a marketplace of political ideas that's full of sewage? I, I don't think, I don't have an easy solution. Education, uh, but there's no interest in educating people by those who benefit from ignorance. I'm sorry I have to be the fly in the ointment, but I'm deeply <laughs> pessimistic about- I'd, I'd just like to throw in that the freedom of the press is one of the most difficult things we all have to cope with in democracies now, because we want a free and diverse media, but what we have are profit-driven media and the new very powerful tech companies uh, which have interests in biasing what you hear. Um, we in Britain are watching the Nevada court case on the future of the Murdoch family holdings and therefore the future of News Corporation and the ownership of some important newspapers uh, and uh, broadcasting companies in the UK as well. So how we make sure that what your average half interested voter learns about what's happening in politics uh, and what the, the major issues and difficulties are does require us to regulate the press and the media much more tightly than we've done in a number of countries until uh, recently. Well put. Uh, I'm going to interrupt the dialogue right now to say that it's about time to go to back to Mike Scott and talk about the questions that have come in. Uh, there is room for more questions in the Q&A uh, button if anyone else has something else, has something they'd like to submit right now. But um, Mike, we'll ask you to take over with what you've already got to work with. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I, I, can I just say thank you to, to the four of you for just uh, such an amazing uh, discussion that we're having uh, at, the, at the moment. Um, uh, there's a question in from uh, Tony Eid. He says, there has been no mention, I think, of the importance of local democracy government. I think, Ronald, you, you mentioned something about it uh, recently. But he says, there's been no mention, I think, of the importance of local democracy government, which has been hollowed out in the UK, despite some success, arguably, with introducing regional mayors. Do panellists think that the centralization of power within democracies has been a significant factor in the widespread loss of belief in the importance of democracy? I mean, to hey, the UK, so perhaps Shami, I can go to yeah, you. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point um, that that questioner makes. I think you get cynicism from um, from the cynicism about democracy comes from a sense that it's not delivering and um, and false expectations. So one of the things we've seen in Britain, I think, is is um, um, we've seen austerity, we've seen extreme austerity in the last 14 years in relation to public spending um, and a sort of blaming of local government. We've seen a uh, a gathering of economic and political power in Westminster in in central government and a blaming of local government for not delivering the services 
including in particular social care for older people, which is a which is a huge, huge challenge that's not been really gripped by anybody yet in in the UK. And uh, it's very easy for central government controls the purse strings and then blames local government for not delivering the services. Yeah. And that is a yeah. recipe for enormous cynicism about politics on 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 behalf of, of, of the citizens. You also have corruption. You also have local government corruption. Let's be clear about that. And contracts, construction contracts and uh, and planning um, decisions, you know, for your mates that that. That happens. People can see that happening uh, in their communities and, you know, before their eyes. So a combination of that false expectation um, and the expectations being being, you know, being trashed and corruption at local level is, a, is yes, it's another layer of disappointment that breeds cynicism. But Shami, doesn't that uh, reflect what's been going on at the top as well? I know. I know. we've had Yeah. Uh, uh, but if you've if you've got blatant blatant uh, uh, wrongs going on in in yeah. government uh, deceptions of people giving huge huge unbelievable uh, contracts to their mates, of course that becomes a norm within society, doesn't it? That yeah. becomes a norm at the local level, and the society yeah. itself it starts to crumble. You know the rot at the top. Uh, I mean, fortunately, oh, we got I mean, rid of that. absolutely. I mean, look, we talked, we talked a lot. We, we using noble, you know, noble language about the rule of law and so on. But you know, at the basic, at the most basic level, it's supposed to be one rule for everybody. And when you can see before your eyes, day after day, that that is not the case. Whether it's parties in Number Ten Downing Street during lockdowns, when you can't go to see your dying parents in the old folks' home. Or whether it's people giving contracts to their mates, or you know whatever it is, it 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 breeds enormous cynicism and disillusionment in democracy. In, in and the it's US. also the, the economy, the world economy, has become so much less linked to localities. Uh, mm -hmm. Fifty to a hundred years ago, uh, if you worked in a town, uh, the the person who employed you was highly likely to live within the same town. You might hate your employer, but you knew him. Uh, now we see uh, in Western Pennsylvania, you know, that they're arguing over whether or not the steel industry should be kept going by the Japanese. Um, and the remoteness of life when you, you've lost your job and your uh, employer's factory has closed and it's de the decision is being taken by someone in another country uh, in a way that you don't understand, mainly on financial grounds is part of what's feeding discontent with very rapid economic and social change. And the sense of, of disempowerment is very strong and that certainly feeds populism. So how we cope with the very rapid economic change we're going through, the challenge of climate change, which also uh, poses all sorts of threats that people see immediately, uh, and the political response to that and the economic measures which that requires the states to take in are all extraordinarily complicated and not easy to explain even to educated publics. I, I do think in the US though that to the extent democracy functions, it functions best at the local level. Uh, I'm coming to you from Stanton, Virginia where I have a home and uh, the city council here is readily accessible to the people. You see the people running the city in the park at the grocery store, at the PTA meeting, uh, and you can't help but interact with your neighbors. And since you're living with each other and you know each other, there's a natural tendency not to be an ass, right? So that there's a level of engagement, positive engagement, dialogue, compromise that exists at the local level that doesn't seem to exist at this, to the same degree, certainly at the state or federal level. In fact, you know, we now have about 800,000 constituents per house member and, uh, you know, if you're in California, you're one constituent of 33 million of a senator. Most Americans have never met their member of Congress or their senator and will never interact with him, her or they, much less a president or vice president. They do meet their mayor, their city councilman, uh, their district attorney. And so I do think and, and believe quite strongly that if people actually engage with each other in real time, even if they fundamentally disagree, it is possible to forge compromises and to achieve 
common goals and objectives. And to me, that's the problem at the state and federal level. Uh, we don't have that engagement anymore between people who fundamentally disagree. Local government, I think, in the United States, most places works pretty well and enjoys high levels of confidence relative to the national government. I do hear what you're saying about funding, though. I've, I've even read here in the U.S. about the problems in Birmingham, or I suppose I should say Brom, not Alabama, but, but England. <laughs> and it's terrible, right? Because the Birmingham government or Brom government uh, is being uh, charged with turning, you know, uh, lead into gold or getting blood out of stones. How mm. do you provide these social services and avoid bankruptcy when the purse strings are in Westminster and you yeah. lack meaningful home rule powers with respect to taxation? I, it's a huge problem. You have power without, a, you, have, you have accountability without power. And this is I, maybe I where your constitution structure. helps you. Maybe this is where constitutionalism and the, the American model is helpful because there's a well, little bit more. Federalism and, and meaningful yeah. home rule in most states yeah. where cities are yeah. largely independent of their state governments. For yeah. example, in Alabama, most cities have policies against discrimination that are comprehensive and include gender status and sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Our state legislature would probably never pass such a law, but in Birmingham, it's illegal to deny housing or employment based on sexual orientation or gender status. Mm -hmm. Why does Birmingham get to do that? The state constitution and state law guarantees a modicum, more than a modicum of home rule to municipalities, and they are responsive to the needs, wants, and desires of their constituents. People in Birmingham, Alabama, don't want employers discriminating, simply put. Uh, I've really been pleased years to hear of my you. life living in Ithaca, New York, and I have great uh, joy dealing with a very, very local government. The problem is that uh, in the world we now live in, you need uh, high level governments uh, to sort out a large number of problems. And you actually also need, as you're discovering in the United States, that the transfer of funds from the richer areas of the country to the poorer, mm. and indeed from richer countries to poorer countries. So uh, we have, for example, uh, a new prime minister in Britain who's been in power for, what, four months at most, shall we, who had uh, spent a great deal of his time since he became prime minister out of the country in international meetings. And currently he's in New York at the UN General Assembly. Uh, I don't think he wanted to do that at all. When you're the head of a government in a, in a, a large or small country, you find on your desk a large number of problems that can't be dealt with purely at the national level, and you have to go and negotiate them internationally. That's very hard to explain to the average elderly voter sitting in Birmingham, Alabama, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and if in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, fed up, he's lost his job. Agreed. Uh, Mike, if I may interject one thing quickly, I, I, yeah. I, think, I think Ron has had uh, an idealistic experience in this small town in Virginia where he has a home where there are many cultural and educational institutions to support this sort of civic health. But in the, the scene across small towns in other states around America is quite grim in some cases. There's a, been a sort of depopulation of small towns, a, uh, a, a, a terrible, almost undescribed, unwitnessed drug problem in some small towns. And, and uh, the influence of of these communities on life in America is, in many respects, diminishing. I'm afraid. That's a fair point, Stanton. And now you're raining on different. Ronald's little. Mo Ronald was, you know, depressed earlier. He comes with a bit of sunshine, and you rain on it. <laughs> oh, so sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's just, that's just, uh, Sandy's, uh, but but again, I think Sandy's point it, it goes back to education. And uh, uh, civic uh, 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 awareness, uh, civic yeah. literacy. Uh, he's right. Uh, Stanton has a Shakespeare festival, uh, the American yeah. Shakespeare Theater. It has the Heifetz Music Festival. Uh, the main employer is Mary Baldwin College. It's a town of about 30,000 whose main industries, if you want to call them that, are educational and cultural. And that draws a different kind of community. And I hadn't thought yeah. about that, but I think that's exactly right. But I think it just proves the point, at least, or provides a datum uh, point uh, for the idea that uh, for democracy to work, you need well-educated, engaged citizens. And so I think the challenge is whether national and international organizations will make efforts, not only in places like the UK and the United States, but in, in uh, the global South, in places mm -hmm. like South Africa, where the EFF 
is a populist challenge to the ANC uh, mm -hmm. and advocates a lot of programs that I think would be deeply problematic economically for South Africa or the nationalism we see mm -hmm. under Modi in India. Uh, yeah. It's not just, you know, the, the U.S. and the U.K. Are, are actually in pretty good shape, uh, relatively speaking. If we're talking about democracy globally, my mm -hmm. God, I mean, the problem is astonishing. And uh, its scale is is breathtaking, and I don't really see any concerted effort. I and mean, maybe I'm, you know, uh, perhaps Adrian can can educate me. But if there are transnational efforts to increase civic literacy and just literacy literacy uh, in the global South in democratic polities, uh, who's doing the work and how is it going? One of the great questions is, uh, what all these Chinese who've gone abroad? For their education uh, will make of it, of it when they're back in China and how much the impact of a liberal education uh, will change future developments in China. I think uh, there are many questions about whether or not the current Chinese model is sustainable, um, but uh, the gamble of sending so many abroad for education I've taught one or two, and I've spent a great deal of time uh, persuading them that they do better by disagreeing with their uh, professor on occasions than by always uh, parroting back to him what he's just said. Um, that is part of what a liberal education is about, which is why dictatorships so often, and populist movements as well, attack the liberal education. Which is one of the reasons why, even though it's wonderful that everyone is learning STEM subjects and studying science and technology, and I really, I, I really admire that, particularly seeing young women go into these subjects, the attacks on uh, the, the 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 humanities and on the arts that we've and and education in those areas that we've seen in the UK, I think, are very troubling. Very troubling what, indeed. What did the well, EU do, if anything, English, about Orban I, shutting down Central European that. University? That was clearly an attack on academic freedom. The university was globally recognized for its excellence and it was run out of Hungary. What did the EU, what did Brussels do in response to see EU being driven out of Hungary uh, by local law? Anything? I mean, there has to be some yeah. consequence, right, to anti-democratic yeah. behavior. I think that's a very, very fair. I think that's a very, very fair charge to lay at the the EU's door. Actually, that it's not you know the tests for membership and continued membership are not supposed to be purely economic. There is supposed to be a freedom element, a, a human rights element too, and the and I I think that's a, I think that's a that's a fair that's a fair charge actually. I, I really think do. that gets back to this idea of of economic globalization and democracy. And so the, the where we are right now is. There's been a flattening of um, an almost a, an amoral view to trade, where it doesn't matter yeah. who you're trading with, it doesn't matter who we're integrating ourselves with economically, it will be a net positive for all. Yeah. And I mean, certainly, when you look at the influence within China, um, you know, the, yes. the the billion of people who've been um, brought out of um, out of poverty uh, and continue to be, I mean, there, there's benefits to it. But what we're now seeing is this backlash and whether that's the backlash against the role that China plays um, around the world and, and in the global south, whether it's the backlash of um, Hungary within the European Union. Um, we're in this moment now where we've seen that our connectivity to authoritarian mm -hmm. countries or countries that are undergoing significant backsliding is actually making us quite vulnerable. Yeah. And we don't necessarily have the tools or we're, we're in the process of building the tools for pushing back. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. And it gets back to something um, thinking about the United Nations and even the Internet. Yeah. I would just, you know, something really niche here. There's currently a treaty that is being negotiated on cybercrime. It's a U.N. Yeah. treaty on cybercrime, which is a, a really large, you know, oftentimes legitimate issue. Right. But it's a treaty that has been driven by Russian diplomats from the very beginning. And essentially, they've been using this treaty to impart their own norms on what type of behavior can be considered a crime. And then uh, get banding together with other authoritarian governments to see this pass through the General Assembly within the coming weeks. And the U.S. is currently deliberating 
whether you know the U.S. should be signing on to this. And it's a treaty that you know it's international cooperation, but it's when it's international cooperation mm -hmm. that is driven by bad actors or let's say mm -hmm. like bad faith actors, it actually results in uh, lessening freedom and increasing vulnerabilities within democracies too. So this treaty yeah. would allow for then. Um, Russia, for example, to request information about people that have committed so, you know, cyber crimes or any sort mm -hmm. of crimes within Russia. And you can think about all of the things that are criminalized within Russia. And through the United Nations, through this treaty, it will allow them to request from other governments, whether that's China or France, to receive information that might be stored on data servers located in those countries about any particular person who they want to go after. So it's really interesting that our our connectivity, you know, our cooperation mm -hmm. is actually used against ourselves and against our values. And I think that's where there is an interesting pushback that is starting to develop. Um, I think that it's just, it's so important that that pushback against the harms of uh, globalization or connectivity is balanced and that it doesn't actually mm -hmm. In many cases, I think it's through more democracy, it's through more transparency, more openness, more education, whatever it might be, that we get out of it. It's not by becoming, um, which is, I think, where the Hungaries and others are, is that they're trying to survive in the 21st century by becoming more authoritarian, by, by looking at places like China or the smaller city states of Singapore and the UAE mm. as like a model for how to govern their yeah. societies. Can I, can I come in now, Adrian? Can I hang yeah. on just a minute? Sure. There's, a, there's another question in, which uh, I'm coming towards the end. So there's a, a question in from uh, from Margaret Schuster, uh, who, who asks, how easy it, is it? I'm just going on to something kind of local now. How easy is it to fiddle the results of elections, especially in the digital age. Different, part, there's different right. mechanisms for fiddling. So I'll just kick it off by saying, you know, something that we keep getting back I to. Haven't got very long though. Yeah, all right, yeah. On, so yeah. Back to the media here, you know, I think the key tactic that we see use is control over the media. Yeah. And, um, you know, particularly when getting back to the local governance versus national governance, when so much of the media is focused on national conversations and where they're setting the agenda um, around the national conversation, and it actually gets people away from the real issues. And that's where it's... It, essentially driven all independent media out of the country. Um, you, if in India, using the cronies who are so close to the Modi government to then purchase um, the key vector of electoral manipulation, when it comes to actually um, you know, compromising electoral systems, it really, that's a cybersecurity question. Um, it's it's essentially the case that most systems are secure, um, but there's also a, a check on on the systems. And so there's but a backup, not, right? There's but paper forgive, me, Adrian, forgive me, Adrian, it's not just a cybersecurity question because you can, you can nobble elections in old fashioned ways too. Right. You can yeah. introduce hurdles before people can register. We just had photographic identity introduced in the, in the UK. Um, before you can go and vote, and that is a huge, that's a significant obstacle to to to, to lots of people. There are all sorts of old fashioned ways of um, of nobbling um, of nobbling elections, postal votes, um, um, voter ID, um, you know, just queues that don't get processed, people lining up into the street, and then the the, the guillotine comes down at ten o'clock at night. Um, and downright intimidation, probably in some places as yeah. um, as well. Uh, the, yeah. the, the, it's Ronald possible Jackson. to suppress voting, which is what uh, uh, Shami's talking about. It's possible to manipulate voters. Certainly, yeah. I agree with Adrian about that. But if in the United States, you know, is Virginia's electoral count system going to be hacked and manipulated? Is mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping going to stuff mm -hmm. our ballot boxes? No. But that's not the relevant question, right? I think both of you are correct to say voter suppression and voter manipulation are pressing and important uh, and more problematic probably than the mechanics of actually tallying the vote. Yeah. William, do you want to say anything on this? No, I, I, nothing new about electoral manipulation. I, I recall being told about a, 
a by-election during the Second World War in which, at a crucial point in the third recount, uh, a, a, a collection of ballots was discovered to have been stuck underneath the duck boards during the counting process. Um, that, that, uh, the right to scrutinize elections is clearly extremely important, and the right to, to report on them through the media is also vital. Um, and I note in, the, in some states in America, uh, arguments about who is going to be allowed in to watch the counts taking place. And that's a very dangerous thing. In, in the United Kingdom and in most other mature democracies, members of the different parties are invited to watch the count mm. just to make sure that it is free and fair and accurate. Thank you. I'm going to start to uh, bring it to a close now. Can I just say, uh, Shami, as a professor of English, I absolutely agree with uh, with what you said. What uh, about the humanities? The decline of the humanities is a, is a real danger for democracy and for our country. It's very very uh, uh, pertinent at the present time. I want to finish really with a, something that's coming from one of our uh, our listeners, uh, his name's Roger, and he said Howard Taft, who was the American president from 1909 to 1913, spoke on the campaign trail in 1912 on the ability of the American people to see through what he called the misrepresentation and demagogy which had been heard during the presidential campaign. Nothing is new, it appears. Um, what, a, what a wonderful discussion and a very important discussion. I think we'll get many, many hits uh, on, on YouTube for this. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you all. I'll, I just asked Sandy if he wants to say anything before I actually bring yes, it well, to Yes, well, thank you. Thank you too, Mike. And thanks to all our panelists. This is just exactly what we aspire to. And uh, the more it runs away with important points, the uh, the better it is in a way. We're thankful to Georgetown University, of course, for continuing to support these dialogues, President Jack Tejoya and uh, Vice President Tom Banchoff, and uh, all our infrastructure, our colleague John McCabe, who uh, runs these programs from month to month without any, any apparent stress or any uh, difficulty. So uh, we'll be back next month again, and we appreciate all of our audience joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for uh, for chairing it. Uh, thank you, Shami, uh, William, Ronald, Adrian. A fascinating and very important uh, discussion. The next free speech project at the Crossroads International Dialogues event in association with the Future of the Humanities Project will be on Wednesday, October the 23rd, when we will be discussing the neglected wars, the neglected crises, those wars that are going on at the moment uh, that hardly get any notice uh, because of everything else that's, that's, that's happening. Uh, the series Cultural Encounters, books that have made a difference, will return on Monday, the 21st of October, when Dr. Philip Booth uh, from St. Mary's University, Twickenham in England, will be discussing the welfare state that we're in job, James Bartholomew's book, The Welfare States That We're In. Uh, my thanks also to, uh, to our colleagues at Georgetown, particularly to uh, Jack DeJoy, that many of you know uh, is very unwell at the moment and we wish him a, a speedy, speedy recovery. Uh, we miss him very much. And also to Tom Banchoff for Blackfriars, to John O'Connor, the regent, to, to Dominic White, the new prior at uh, Blackfriars Hall, and to Richard Finn, the director of the Las Casas Institute, the Campion Hall to Dr. Uh, Nick Austin. My thanks too to uh, John McCabe and to Maggie Scott, who helps uh, helps me in, in organizing all of this from this end. Uh, thank you, those of you who have, answered, uh, who have asked questions and who have attended today. I'm Professor Mike Scott, I'm fellow and senior dean at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. You can follow me on Facebook as Michael Kerscott or LinkedIn as Professor Michael Scott. I do not uh, appear on X or whatever it is called. Until next time, take care.
keep safe. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very bye much. Bye.